Good evening, everyone. So I'm the last man standing today uh, between you and your independence. Uh, two days of thorough sessions, a lot of gyan, a lot of knowledge. So I'll try to make it as crisp, as concise, as interesting as I can. And uh, we'll see where we get to from here. OK, so as you can see on the slide, uh, which is there right on the screen, today I will be apprising you on a topic which is boosting memory-based collaborative filtering using content metadata. Sounds very heavy. It isn't, actually. So uh, let's start. <clears throat> Perhaps, uh, you know, before I, I have, I've got a quick video around machine learning, but before that, I want to talk about three things. One is an instance, second is an inspiration, and third is a perspective. And the reason I want to cover all three of them is, for me personally, these three are very closely interlinked with what we know and what we understand today about machine learning. So let me start with an instance. How many of you know a famous chess player called Gary Kasparov? Majority of us, right? Now, <clears throat> and how many of you have read a book which is written by Gary, which is Deep Thinking? Just one, OK. So uh, I recently read that book. And apparently, it very closely knits with the way we understand artificial intelligence and machine learning. Gary, in his book, quotes a very famous instance uh, of 1990s, when it was the first time in the human history a human was defeated by a machine in the game of chess. The reason he has titled his book as Deep Thinking is because the name of the computer that he was defeated by was known as Deep Blue, a computer that was conceptualized and designed by IBM. Before he had lost that game, Gary said that he was really confident about the fact that no one can beat him in a game of chess. For only one reason, because right before that game, a couple of months ago, he'd actually played a game of chess which is known as Similus. What happens in a game of Similus is one player plays against 32 different players. The unique thing about that game of Similus was against Gary, there were 32 computers. And Gary defeated each one of them. So after that game, he said, you know what, I'm invincible. No one can defeat me. But something opposite happened. He was defeated by Deep Blue. <clears throat> and right after that game, there was a lot of media coverage. People wrote and media uh, mentioned Gary that, you know what, humans have been defeated by a machine. Humans have been defeated by computers. And Gary gave a very positive perspective to that, that, you know what, it's not a defeat of a human by a machine. It actually is a defeat of a human by a human, for only one reason, because it's the humans who have created that machine. So for all of us who have a, who have a sense, after reading a lot of articles on the internet, that you know what, one fine day, AI will take over, machine learning will take over everything, the fact is that's not right. That's one. <clears throat> the second is an inspiration. And here I want to talk about a famous British scientist called Alan Turing. Have you heard about him, Alan Turing? So he's the guy who's actually <clears throat> known for designing or actually conceptualizing the principles of artificial intelligence. It all happened during the time of World War II, when British was reeling under the Nazi uh, attacks on the British warships. For only one reason, while the secret codes or the positioning of the warships was aired and the British intelligence agencies could actually hack those messages, but they were not able to decrypt those messages. For only one reason, because those messages were actually generated by a machine called Enigma. And the beauty about that machine was the encryption setup of that machine changed after every 24 hours. That means even if British intelligence agencies were able to crack one code, the moment clock changed next day, the encryption code also had changed. Alan Turing was appointed by the MI6 uh, of the British intelligence to actually design a machine, and he was working in a very secretive setup. And he was actually uh, misunderstood by British police as if he is a spy, because he was actually working in confinement, not talking to anyone, in a closed room setup. And when he was arrested by the British police, the inspector asked him a question. You know what, I understand from your neighbors, you're making a machine which can think like humans. Alan said, no, that's not right. 
inspector said, let me repeat my question. I understand that you're making a machine which can think like humans. Alan said, no, that's not right. The inspector said, then you tell me what's right. Alan said, it's right that I'm making a machine, but I'm making a machine which can think. For only one reason, because two human beings also cannot think like each other. My preference could be red, your preference could be blue. My preference could be orange, your preference could be banana. That's the second bit. And the third bit is a perspective. There was a point in time when a lot of ATM machines came into play, and there was a lot of noise that, you know what, with the onset of ATM machines, there will be rampant job losses in the banking industry. The role of cash uh, tellers or the cashiers will actually diminish. There will not be many roles, job losses and stuff. But I can't think of a situation or I can't think of reading an article which would have mentioned that because of ATM's banking industry or the roles in banking, particularly from a branch banking perspective, has changed considerably. For only one reason, because we, even today, we need the cashiers at the desk. The reason I brought this into perspective was, come what may, whatever level of automation uh, is driven by machine learning or AIs of the world, we would still need human beings to be by their side because it's the humans who does the thinking part, who does the ideating part, who does the conceptualization part. <coughs> so with that, let's start. Um, let's have a quick look at this uh, short video. Our ability to learn and get better at tasks through experience is part of being human. When we're born, we know almost nothing and can do almost nothing for ourselves. But soon, we're learning and becoming more capable every day. But did you know that computers can do the same? Machine learning brings together statistics and computer science to enable computers to learn how to do a given task without being programmed to do so. Just as your brain uses experience to improve at a task, so can computers. Say you need a computer that can tell the difference between a picture of a dog and a picture of a cat. You could begin by feeding it images and telling it, this one's a dog, that one's a cat. A computer program to learn will seek statistical patterns within the data that will enable it to recognise a cat or a dog in the future. It might figure out, on its own, that cats have shorter noses and that dogs come in a larger variety of sizes, and then represent that information numerically, organising it in space. But, crucially, it's the computer, not the programmer, that identifies those patterns and establishes the algorithm by which future data will be sorted. One example of a simple yet highly effective algorithm is to find the optimal line separating cats from dogs. When the computer sees a new picture, it checks which side of the line it falls on and then says either cat or dog. But of course there can be mistakes. The more data the computer receives, the more finely tuned its algorithm becomes and the more accurate it can be in its predictions. Machine learning is already widely applied. It's the technology behind facial recognition, text and speech recognition, spam filters on your inbox, online shopping or viewing recommendations, credit card fraud detection and so much more. At the University of Oxford, machine learning researchers are combining statistics and computer science to build algorithms that can solve more complex problems more efficiently, using less computing power. From medical diagnoses to social media, the potential of machine learning to transform our world is truly mind-blowing. So one of the reasons I wanted to play this video was because in my personal experience, I've come through a number of individuals who've had various connotations to what machine learning is all about. For some, it's a fancy uh, word. For some, it's a fashion statement. For some, it's, a, it's an important mention in their resume because they feel that it will help them to get the right job. But I think one of the underlying message in this video is there's something which really enables machine learning. And without that, machine learning is not successful. And what is that? That's data. So if, if I was to give a simple definition to what machine learning is, I would say machine learning is the science. Of course, it's the science because it's a way we work of programming computers so that they can learn from data. That's about it. And of course, <coughs> There are some fun facts around machine learning as well. One, of course, is we would still need human operators because humans generate data. Without humans, there's no data. Sitting right here in the auditorium, we're generating a lot of data for people who are messaging on WhatsApp, for people who are on calls, for people who are even viewing and recording this video. 
or maybe uh, placing a social media post, there's a data, a lot of data that's been generated right now as well. It's a vision with power. And of course, efficiency is the key. We've, we've always heard from a number of data scientists across the, the spectrum of industries that, you know what, I've got data, but the data quality isn't right. So data quality and accuracy is most important. And one of the myths is, you know, you need to be a champion in maths to be a data scientist, to be an expert in machine learning. The fact is, that's not right. You need a basic understanding, that's about it. My personal recommendation, if you know what's the full form of bot mass, you can actually do wonders in machine learning. All you need is a better understanding and interpretation of what data is and what meaningful analysis can you bring from that data. So let's come on to the subject. Uh, we're talking about collaborative filtering, uh, which is memory-based, but the underlying principle around it is the recommender system. Now, what essentially is a recommender system? A recommender system is basically a set of algorithms which is used to define or suggest a user basis his or her interaction with a particular platform. Now, that could either be an online portal, an e-commerce portal like Amazon's of the world, or it could either be Netflix's as well. And it is really important in today's context. We've had a number of sessions earlier today as well, and there was a session which uh, mentioned the importance of uh, user-generated reviews and remarks, and how does it actually impact or affect our shopping abilities, our decision to buy something. Today, we rely heavily on what's been recommended to us, whether we are shopping, whether we are uh, watching a movie, even if we are reading, or on Facebook as well. All these portals, all these <coughs> technologies use recommender systems to ensure we as users get the right set of recommendation, not what Netflix or the company thinks, but basis the way we have interacted with that portal, the way we have purchased or browsed or transacted on that portal. One of the key aspects around recommended systems is there is, of, of course, an element of filtering. And there are two types of filtering which is normally used by all these uh, companies. The first is a content-based filtering, and the second is collaborative filtering. So for our session today, we'll be focusing on what collaborative filtering is. Collaborative filtering is essentially of three types. One is a memory-based, second is a model-based, and third is hybrid. <coughs> the way collaborative filtering works is uh, <coughs> it's basically generated, uh, it's a user-generated uh, data, basis one's interaction habit with a particular set of portal or a platform. It uh, uses rating data to compute the similarity between the users and the items. That's the first part of it. The second is the model-based, where we may, we may design a machine learning algorithm which would be agnostic or independent of the way a user interacts with a particular set uh, on the portal or on a system. And third is a hybrid, which is actually a mix of both memory-based and model-based. <coughs> so let's talk about and let's understand more about what exactly is memory-based. We also understand memory-based as uh, a neighborhood-based system for only one reason, because memory-based collaborative filtering works in a particular ecosystem and within that ecosystem, what lies is a high correlation between the way a user is transacting or behaving or interacting on a particular set of platform. And this can be further classified under two uh, broad areas. One is a user, another is an item. So let's understand this based on an example, what you see on the screen here. The graphic on the screen shows under user-based, there are three users, A, B, and C, the way they interact actually defines what the recommendation would be basis the user's interaction pat pattern. As an example, if you were to shop or buy something on Amazon, if you are looking at the ratings of a particular product, that's the right example of the way a user has transacted or interacted with a particular product. And if you were to buy a particular product, you would also see recommendation on uh, the portal which particularly talks about, you know what, you can buy this as well. That's an item-based um, recommendation. If you see on the uh, graphic on the screen, particularly in the user base, as I said, it's an ecosystem-based model. It will only interact or it will only govern basis a certain threshold, i.e., 
what lies within a sphere of influence of a particular user. As an example, for 1, 2, and 3, maybe we can deem them as a user, and so are 4 and 5. One to, around 1, you can see number 2 and number 3, which actually shows that user 1 would get recommendations from user 2 and 3, but not from users 4 and 5, because they're outside the threshold. What you see on the right is, if in case we remove the sphere of influence, <coughs> what exactly it depicts is a correlation between the multiple users, which is user 1 may feed into recommendation for 2, 3, and 4, because 2, 3, and 4 are interlinked, but not, four and, uh, but not sorry, 5 and 6. They are clearly out of sphere. From an item-based perspective, we've got three users here, user 1, user 2, and user 3. User 1 likes oranges, user 1 also likes apple, and user 1 also likes banana. User 2 has late preference around orange and, and late preference around apple. So what will be the recommended uh, product that the system would recommend to user 3 will be the apple. If you would notice one uh, unique uh, aspect here, the system would not recommend banana to user 3 because it's clearly an outlier. It has got no interaction history with user 1 and user 2. So technically, that's how item-based filtering works. In terms of advantages of collaborative filtering, there are a number of advantages. <clears throat> the biggest advantage is you don't need a lot of plentiful of historical data. You actually can use it right at a point in time. That's one. You don't need a lot of background around the data. You just implement it, and it just gets activated. There's no you know, item cold start problem. Now, what essentially do we mean by item cold start problem is when you have got no information, you can still predict the item rating without waiting for a user to purchase it, which is actually beautiful. And the third aspect is it captures a change in interest over time. Today, I may want to buy uh, an iPhone, but tomorrow I may want to, I may I want to buy something else. And that's not just me, that's a set of users. That's the beauty which the system absorbs because it also studies the changes in the patterns, the way user interacts with the portal. So that brings me to an end. I had shortened the presentation just to ensure I don't stand much <coughs> in between of your independence and uh, the session. I'm happy to take any questions if there are any.